All right, I think we're good to go. I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, joining us tonight for Classic Albums 33 and a Third, John Prine, John Prine by Aaron Osman. I want to thank you again. My name is Neil, and I'm a Programs and Exhibits Specialist at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. On behalf of our partners at the Glenview and Northbrook Libraries, I would like to welcome you to tonight's program, 33 and a Third, John Prine's John Prine by Aaron Osman. 33 and a Third is a series of short books about popular music, each book focusing on an iconic individual album that occupies a specific place in music history by artists ranging from Aretha Franklin to Devo, from James Brown to Pagazi. We're thrilled to have you with us tonight and hope you'll consider joining us each month as we learn more about iconic albums. We're trying to take advantage of the virtual space that's been created by the pandemic and bring you authors to discuss a wide range of essential albums. Last month's Another Green World, by Brian Eno to tonight's John Prine by John Prine. Tonight is our sixth 33 and a third program. We're at the halfway point in a year long series. We're so grateful for the opportunity to learn more about these iconic artists and records. And we're also grateful to all of you watching at home who help support library programming like this. In this remarkable book, Aaron Osmond paints an in-depth portrait of people, places, and experiences that inspired Prine's landmark debut. Aaron Osmond is a Midwest native and a veteran of Chicago newsrooms, whose music journalism and criticism appears in Uncut, Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, New York Times, The Guardian, Washington Post, No Depression, Billboard, amongst other publications. Her debut book, Jason Molina Riding with the Ghost was named Best Music Book of 2017 by Pitchfork, and it's a wonderful book. I highly recommend that one, too. She's also the author of long-form album notes for box sets, reissue, box set reissues like by bands like, like Blondie and Husker Du. She teaches at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Aaron. Hi there. Thanks for having Aaron. me. Thanks, Neil and Michael and Phil and Jennifer. Um, this feels like a homecoming for me um, because I consider Chicago my home. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about um, my book and this album um, with a hometown audience. So thanks for having me. Um, first, I'm going to start um, with a talk that I've kind of put together. Um, and then afterward, I'll read a short, a short section of the book. Um, and then We'll do a little Q&A. Um, so let me share my screen with you. Okay, um, so I'm Erin Osman and I am from the Midwest. Uh, specifically, I'm from Indiana, um, which is your next door neighbor, uh, the Hoosier State. Um, it's a nickname whose origins I've always found a bit nebulous, um, but it's one that I wear with pride. And I think the writer Kurt Vonnegut, a fellow Hoosier, got it right when he said, I don't know what it is about Hoosiers, but wherever you go, there is always a Hoosier doing something very important there. Thanks, Kurt. Um, most of you all know Indiana is sort of state, shaped like a sock, and I grew up in the Big Toe down south um, in Evansville, Indiana. It's a small city of about 100,000 people across the Ohio River from Kentucky. Um, growing up, my dad, who was this nice man seated behind the turkey there, um, he was a huge fan of John Prine, um, and he played the self-titled album Ad Nauseam in our family minivan on the family stereo. Um, so I sort of grew up with Prine um, and this album through um, my dad's fandom. Um, but like John Prine and the Prine family, um, my dad's extended family is spread across Western Kentucky. Um, and so like John Prine over summers and holidays, um, we would travel to my dad's ancestral land. Um, and so this song in particular holds uh, significance for me. Um, and so I thought I'd just play a clip. So uh, that song in particular um, holds significance um, in my life and my family's life um, because it illuminated um, our particular journey in this way that I don't think anyone else has illuminated it before. Um, and, and so growing up in Southern Indiana um, and having family um, all around here in Western Kentucky, um, I always felt this synergy between Kentucky um, and Midwestern states, right? Um, and it's not uncommon. Uh, most, the most recent data from the New York Times says that about 10% of all people born in Kentucky now live in Indiana or Illinois, right? So to me, 
um, there's always been this connection between the Midwest and the South. And I think um, when I think of the broader term Middle America, um, I've always attached this connection to it, um, that Middle America sort of connects these two regions in this beautiful seamless way, right? Um, we're different, but we're not so different, right? And actually, um, that's what I think John Pride achieves with a lot of his music, this sort of unifying sentiment, right? But especially on his first album. Um, for so many of us who grew up in the Midwest, we had you know, family members um, with thick Southern accents. We grew up on Southern food. Um, we took these sojourns to places where our parents and grandparents you know, loved and lived, but had to leave in search of greater opportunity, right? Um, my dad's dad, my paternal grandfather, um, he left Caldwell County um, right here um, because he didn't want to end up in the coal mines like his father. Right, um, so he traveled to Evansville and became a tool and die maker, um, and that um, sort of mirrors the Prines family journey, right? Like they ended up in Maywood, Illinois, um, for sort of the same reasons. Um, and all of this is to say, I'm sharing my background with you um, because I have this shared sense of provenance with John Prime. Um, it's sort of like etched in my bones, right? It flows through my marrow. Um, it lives inside of me, um, and so that became a very important theme in this book. Um, this book is a biography of Prime's early years in this first album, um, but it's also a biography um, of time and place. Um, so I did my undergraduate work at Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, and then after graduation, I moved up to Chicago, um, about six hours north as the crow flies with pit stops. Um, and then I lived in Chicago for 15 years. Chicago is my second home. Um, and there um, I built my career. I went from magazine intern um, to a digital producer, editor, and reporter at publications like the Chicago Tribune, um, Time Out Chicago, and Chicago Magazine. Um, and in the 15 years that I lived in Chicago um, and worked as a music and culture reporter, um, I became deeply familiar um, with Chicago institutions, right? Um, like the Old Town School of Folk Music. Um, to my mind, OTS um, is America's premier folk music school, right? Um, and I saw so many wonderful performances there over the years at the location on Lincoln Avenue. Um, and I learned, you know, all about uh, OTS's sort of invaluable contributions to the tradition of folk music study and performance. Um, oops. Um, and then, you know, my first year in Chicago, um, like many Midwesterners who land in a bigger city, um, I, you know, I didn't come from money or family connections, so I worked four jobs <laughs> to pay my rent. Um, when I was 22 years old, I worked four jobs. Um, I interned for free at a local magazine um, back when that wasn't illegal. Um, <laughs> I worked at a cafe in Lincoln Park called the Bourgeois Pig. I don't know if any of you remember that spot. Um, I taught English as a second language during night classes at the City Colleges of Chicago. Um, and lastly, uh, I answered phones for this woman um, who was a hairstylist and she had a private studio in Old Town. Um, and that last job was particularly exciting to me, not because of the work, um, but because of my lunches, um, I could walk around Old Town. Um, I you know, navigated the streets and sort of interrogated um, the vestiges of the Chicago folk music scene. Right, um, and as someone who's always loved folk music and singer songwriters and country music, um, it was so exciting for me to be working kind of in the middle of this once vibrant scene. Um, so when I was working that job, um, I went to the parking lot in North Avenue where the first OTS location once stood. Um, I found the, sp the sports bar that once housed the Earl of Old Town, right? Um, I walked up to the OTS location on Armitage Avenue um, and found the storefront where the fifth peg used to be. Um, I went to the Old Town Ale House and ordered beers and shots and sort of imagined the bygone bohemia that hung out there. Um, you know, the folk scene and the second city comedy scene, um, all those folks who were once kind of stationed on its stools, right? Um, There is, um, I, I was just really invigorated um, by imagining folks like John Prine and Steve Goodman and Bonnie Kolak, Jim Post, Fred Holstein, um, all those musicians, uh, folks like Roger Ebert, Studs Terkel, Shel Silverstein, Bill Murray, John Belushi, Belushi, Del Close, all these titans kind of of our culture um, wandering around this hub of North Avenue and Well Street in the 60s and 70s, right? That was really um, something special for me to kind of explore my first year in Chicago. 
Um, and so that's kind of what, <laughs> what I did as I was making my way. Um, so it was so amazing to stand in the place that discovered and incubated John Prine and his salad days, right? Um, whose streets and figures are inextricably linked with one of our country's finest songwriters. Um, it gave me the sense when I was 22 years old um, that sort of anything was possible. Um, and then over my next 15 years in Chicago, um, the city gave to me an abundance, right? Um, and the thing that I love about Chicago and why I hold it so dear um, is that I feel like it celebrates its sons and daughters with an enthusiasm that I've never really witnessed anywhere else. Um, its love of its own is totally singular. Um, I know I benefited from that and Prime definitely benefited from it. Um, and I, I wanna share a clip um, of Prime performing on uh, WTTW, local television in 1972 that I think sort of illustrates uh, this pride. Did you know Sam Stone? Uh, no, it just rhymed with home. Huh? It just rhymed with home. That's it. <laughs> you know somebody who was a Sam Stone? Uh, but it's more or less a, uh, uh, just kind of a dissolution after I got out of the army, you know. That's uh, what it started out to be. And, uh, that's the way the song fell together. So. Where were you in uh, the days we were talking about Gator Horn in early 60s? Uh, I don't know. I still remember the same country songs in the closet. You made a lot of trips. You're from Chicago, from Maywood, right? Maywood, right. right. Proviso East? That's as close as I am. Proviso East. Yeah. Proviso Middle. Right. <laughs> uh, yet you went, uh, you went back home to Kentucky, and you really weren't influenced uh, a lot by the, the city folk people. Uh, your, your influences came out of out of your home back in Kentucky, right? Um, mainly, yeah. I just never got a chance to ever go down to any clubs or anything. I saw Ray Charles twice. <laughs> <laughs> they ought to do it. <laughs> uh, you were at the game of horror, at the uh, Earl of Old Town, rather, uh, I don't know how long ago, and a guy walked in. Right? A lot of people we've been talking about tonight uh, started at the gate. Uh, you know, we mentioned Bill Cosby and people like that. Uh, you were in a similar situation. You were at the uh, world famous talent. You were sitting at the Earl one night, and uh, Chris Christopherson walked in. And what happened there? Oh yeah, Stevie yeah. Goodman brought him over, and uh, Steve sings over the Earl a lot too, along with the Bonnie Kolak and uh, the Holstein brothers. And uh, uh, Stevie been playing with uh, Christopherson over at uh, uh, Richard Harding's place. Quite nice. And uh, he brought him over to hear uh, some of my songs over there. And uh, he was about the only audience. It was pretty late at night. You know, there's a lot of empty chairs around. Uh, we were getting ready to close up, but uh, we stayed open an extra hour. You know, did he say, I'll make you a star, kid? No, no, he yeah. just, uh, no, he just, uh, uh, he listened to the songs. That was good, good enough for me. Speaking of songs, there's a, there's a new album out there. So I, I love that clip because I think, um, I don't know if you saw, but Shel Silverstein is in the front of the audience there. And, um, you know, clearly there's all this enthusiasm for Prine um, after the release of his first album, but Prine is so low key, right? Um, and at this time in his life, he wasn't terribly comfortable as a performer. And I don't know that he was comfortable um, necessarily with media. And so I love just how low key and kind of modest he is, um, and I feel like it's not a persona, it's very authentic. Um, and it's it's funny when he says, when the interviewer says, um, you're not influenced by city folks. And he said, well, you know, mainly, mainly no. Um, but that's not entirely true because so much of the first album is drawn um, from scenes and experiences um, from his life in the Western suburbs, right? So city adjacent. Um, so, so yes, he was influenced by Millburg County in Kentucky, um, but also his life in the suburbs. Um, so eventually, you know, like any um, Chicagoan who loves John Prine, um, I made my way out to the su Western suburbs and I toured Maywood, um, Illinois, where Prine grew up. 
Um, uh, of course, I drove by the old Prime family home. Um, I'm sure many of you have taken this journey, this pilgrimage as well. Um, and by Proviso East High School, where Prime went to school. Um, I, I loved sort of imagining its streets decades prior, you know, Prime kind of running up to the local hardware store to buy 45s or over to Maywood Park in the pool hall, right? Um, I crossed over into Oak Park and went to Val's Hollow Records, um, which was a shop that Prime loved and frequented in the 1970s. Um, so, you know, so many scenes from Prime's suburban Chicago upbringing um, and travels to Western Kentucky end up on this first album. Um, when we think about songs like Paradise, Hello in There, Far From Me, Your Flag Decal Won't Get You Into Heaven Anymore, um, songs like Sam Stone, Six O'Clock News, uh, those lyrics, those characters, those images, um, they're all drawn directly from um, his early life and his early experiences um, during this period in the 60s um, and early 70s. Um, so because of my personal connection to Prine and his roots, right, and because of my love of this album and my dad's love of this album and my family's love of this album, and because Maywood, Western Kentucky, and Chicago's folk music scene are so important um, to Prine, uh, who Prine was and who he became, um, I wanted to tell all of those stories in this book. Um, I, I'm a journalist um, and I love research and reporting. Um, so the first thing I did was I conducted um, a host of original interviews. Um, I dug up um, folks um, from the Old Town School of Folk Music um, who either knew Prine um, or know of him from their archive, right? I dug up folks like um, Frank Hamilton and Ray Tate um, who were teaching with Prine and, and, and his older brother Dave were there. Um, I talked to folks like Bonnie Kolak who used to perform on the scene with Prine, um, I interviewed um, the living um, members of the Memphis Boys, um, who was the house band at American Sound Studios in Memphis, who played on this album. Um, speaking to Gene Chrisman, um, who was the drummer, and Bobby Wood, who was the pianist, um, was such a treat um, because they were so candid about the fact that they'd never really worked on a folk record before, and they weren't quite sure, um, you know, where to put Prine. And so it was sort of like they made the best of the situation. Um, and so I, I brought in all of these characters' voices, um, as many folks as I could find um, through original interviews. Uh, Prine's brothers, Billy and Dave, graciously spoke to me. Um, they were wonderful. Um, Prine's first wife, Ann Carroll, um, I interviewed her, and she um, brought a lot of um, sort of personal insight and some great stories that made it into the book. Um, so, so that was kind of like my first step. Um, but then the Old Town School of Folk Music maintains its own archive. Um, and its uh, chief archivist and some of the instructors there um, were so instrumental um, and so helpful along the way. Um, I also sourced a lot of information from the Chicago Public Library. Um, and then I used online archives. I used newspapers.com. Um, and then I used um, a music archive called Rocks Back Pages. It's an archive of music specific publications. Um, and that was all very helpful, the use of, of these archives. Um, and what I was going for in the book and what I think I achieved um, is a story of Prime and this album, but also of time and place, um, the scenes and the figures that helped inform and nurture Prime, right? In the Western suburbs, um, in Old Town and Lincoln Park in the 70s. Um, I go into the folk music tradition in Chicago and how important the folk music scene and the folk music revival in Chicago was at the time. Like I think everyone thinks of Greenwich Village in San Francisco, but in fact, um, the folk music revival in Chicago was so vibrant with clubs like the Gate of Horn, right, and the Earl of Old Town um, and the Quiet Night and all those kind of spots. Um, I really wanted to convey how important the folk music scene was um, and also how, um, John Prine's older brother Dave kind of got swept up in it and introduced his little brother to it. Um, and how, you know, if, if Dave hadn't become involved, um, I'm not sure if Prine would have, right? Um, and so all of this sort of added up to John Prine becoming one of Chicago's cultural titans, right? A, a kind of a symbol of Chicago's low key brilliance. Um, and I think another reason this was so important to me, um, talking about Prine. Um, and Midwestern identity and Middle American identity um, is because sometimes there's this flyover country mentality that can happen, right? Like um, as someone who has spent most of my life in the Midwest, um, I've, I've felt it. I've, I've seen how the media and how politicians um, 
can, can sort of underestimate us or, or sort of like think we live in a cornfield, right? Um, and so I, I wanted to really illuminate the, the vibrant, rich cultural traditions of the region in this book as well. Um, and then Prime is such a symbol of that. Um, so, so yeah, that's a little bit about um, me and where I'm coming from and, and the book. Um, exit out of this. Okay, um, so I'm going to read um, a chapter that covers Prine's local discovery in Chicago. Um, and I love that, again, that y'all are local audience and you'll know kind of what I'm talking about. Um, but I love, I love this chapter and I love this story. Um, and I hope, I hope you enjoy it too. Um, this is chapter six of the book um, and the title is, And Then He Has You. The story of Prine's first nightclub performance and subsequent discovery has been recounted so many times that it seems apocryphal, a plot point whose details have been softened and molded into an enticing soundbite. As with many oral traditions, it's difficult to tell the difference between the truth and the tale, but music's best storyteller was in fact launched by this great story, a mirror between life and art whose poetic underpinnings are a perfect reflection of Prine's inimitable work. And it all happened one summer night in 1970 at a little Chicago folk music club when John Prine was just 23 years old. As Prine told it, he was one of a handful of guitar students in the audience at the fifth peg one night after class, kvetching over beers. Quote, I made a remark about the people who were getting up to sing. This is awful, he said. Quote, so the people I was sitting with said, you get up and try. And I did. But Ray Tate, who was Prine's guitar teacher at OTS, remembered it differently. He recalled that Prine came into the club one night when the house and the open mic schedule was packed. Quote, he waited around for a while and he wasn't too happy about it, Tate said. Unable to put him up, Tate invited Prine to come back the following week and promised to give him a spot. Quote, I felt terrible having to send him home without putting him up on the stage, he said. When Prine returned the next week, he didn't have to wait too long. This is where Prine and Tate's memories converge. After performing Sam Stone, which was then titled Great Society Conflict Veterans Blues, the audience of about 10 or so fell mute. It was the kind of awkward silence that makes seconds feel like centuries. Quote, I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble, Prine said. But then the entire room, including Prine's teacher, erupted in applause, unsure what they just witnessed, but confident it was important. Quote, I was really impressed by how beautiful the songs were, how well written and clever, Tate said. Prine also performed Paradise and Old People, which was later titled Hello in There, shaky but determined to get through it. Whether Prine reluctantly took to the stage or, as Tate remembered, vied for a spot, one thing is certain, he was nervous. John and Dave had performed covers at the dedication of the Fred, Ham Fred Hampton Pool during the 1969 Maywood Folk Festival, a short-lived suburban celebration founded by a neighborhood friend. Quote, we were the only white folks there, Dave recalled. Prine had given plenty of living room performances, but he hadn't tested any of his original songs on a live audience that wasn't his family. Quote, I was writing these songs totally for myself, not thinking anyone was ever gonna hear them, Prine said. And I went from that to being a very ner nervous public performer who had, had no voice whatsoever. To sing for other people was really painful. Prine explained that in his earliest days, he spoke the words to his songs, fast or slow, depending on the melody, and held certain notes to let the audience know he was transitioning to a new idea. Quote, that's how limited I was, he said. Eventually, he settled into a nasal, twang-infused delivery that would elicit a million comparisons to Bob Dylan. But for now, he was a mailman at the crossroads of a curious proposition. According to Prime, someone who worked at the club offered him a regular gig on the spot. But that may be an exaggeration. The offer may have come after a few open mic gigs, as others have remembered. What's certain is the popularity of his appearances happened with unbelievable speed. Prine began playing Sunday nights, earning half of the door in June and July of 1970. He was then promoted to Friday and Saturday nights in the fall. Quote, when they started charging people to get in, we would get a cut of that, his first wife, Anne Carroll, recalled. Quote, so I would stand by the door and collect something like $2.50 from each person. Ed Holstein, who worked at OTS's store across the street, had also become a part-time bartender at the Fifth Pig and took in one of Prine's earliest performances, wandering in on a night off from work. Quote, he played Illegal Smile, Paradise, Hello in There, and Sam Stone, and it was pretty amazing. These songs were so powerful, I knew right away that something was going on, he said. Quote, I immediately told my brother Fred and Steve Goodman about him. 
As momentum began to build, Prime worried that he didn't have enough songs, that his set was becoming redundant for repeat patrons. So he wrote Souvenirs, which is included on his second album, Diamonds in the Rough, and his 65 Chevelle while driving to the fifth peg. Prine explained that he set out to write the most sophisticated melody he could muster. And it's more complex than the songs that comprise John Prine, Twinkling Like a Constellation. Quote, I thought I'd written a jazz melody, he explained. I was surprised to find out it had the same three chords all my other songs have. <laughs> Its imagery and emotion originates from a carnival Prine attended with his brothers when they were young. Amid the festivities, his oldest brother Dave wandered off and Prine was convinced he'd never find him again, an unprecedented overwhelming fear that burned in his memory. Quote, I kept that emotion buried somewhere and it came out in souvenirs, he said. Prine also recalled the image of Dave after they reunited, holding small plastic horses, souvenirs from the carnival, but also of Prine's memory, a crystallized moment of relief. As the months wore on, more and more faces from the Chicago folk scene wandered in to catch Prime on word of mouth recommendation. Steve Goodman came in a couple of times, first with the Holstein brothers, Fred and Ed, and later with rising local folk singer, Bonnie Kolak. Um, she'd come to Chicago from Iowa in late 1968, hoping to break into the thriving Northside club scene and almost immediately landed a gig as house performer at the Quiet Night. Quote, the first time I saw John play, I walked up to him and I said, you don't have to worry about a thing because your gift will carry you through. Kolak recalled, he had this wry way and this interesting way of looking at the world and could project that into his writing. He had no pretense. Prine and the Holsteins became buddies, jamming together in the brothers' apartments or commiserating over beers. Fred was an older, a scholar of folk music and Ed shared in Prine's love of a good heart laugh. Both brothers had worked in, old in the Old Town School store selling strings and other accoutrements. Quote, Eddie and me, we used to go to lunch together because I used to like to watch Eddie eat, Prine said. He'd eat for hours. He was just a little skinny guy then and you'd wonder where the food was. Fred Holstein was one of few people Prine knew who had a reel-to-reel -reel recorder and he tracked demos for Prine after he'd written a song. Quote, he'd bring it over and then Fred would do it that night, Ed Holstein said. People wanted to do Prine songs right away. One day, Ed shared a couple of melodies he'd written and asked if Prine had any lyrics, thinking they could come up with the co-write. Quote, he had one verse, I am an old woman. And I was looking for something a little bit more like there's a hole in daddy's arm, Ed said. That one verse soon became one of Prime's most beloved songs, Angel from Montgomery, but Holstein just couldn't see it at the time. Quote, it just didn't move me, he said. It became a much better song later. Though Ed turned down Prime's idea of a middle-aged woman who feels older than she is, a rejection that would haunt him the rest of his life, it stuck with Prime. And so he finished Angel from Montgomery soon after their exchange in 1970. Prine believed the setting was inspired by Hank Williams. Montgomery, Alabama is where the country icon's career began and where it ended when he was laid to rest. But Holstein has posited that it was drawn from the spirit of progress, a bronze statue of an angelic woman on top of the former Montgomery Ward headquarters on Chicago Avenue. Either way, the image Prine conjured when writing it was salient. Quote, I had this really vivid picture of this woman standing over the dishwater with soap on her hands and just walking away from it all, Prine said. So I just kept that whole image in my mind when I was writing the song, and I just let it pour out of that character's heart. Another example of Prine's innate ability to write empathetic, character-driven lyrics illuminating, over to, illuminating overlooked portions of American society, the song is also an early example of Prine's tacit feminism. Rather than talk over the woman, he allowed her to speak for herself, revealing the depths of her dissatisfaction and longing rather than funneling her feelings through a man's third-party narration. Two years later, Bonnie Cola cut an excellent full band country rock version of Angel from Montgomery um, for the small but mighty Chicago independent label Ovation Records. It cemented a fondness between the two musicians that survived well into their golden years. This was before Bonnie Raitt's cover from Streetlights, which helped propel Prine onto the national stage. Quote, with Prine, we felt this realness, this depth of a person, Kolak said, that was hardly common. He connected with our humanity, with how people feel. Not everybody can write those lyrics. The first week in October, 1970, Roger Ebert, the film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times, wandered into the fifth peg during one of Prine's sets after walking out of a particularly rotten film. Ebert had been with the paper for three years and was, famili was a familiar face in Old Town, where he downed beer and shot specials among friends new and old at O'Rourke's, O'Rourke's Pub, the Old Town Ale House, and the Earl of Old Town. Old Town and Lincoln Avenue in the 1960s and 70s was where Chicago went to be young, to drink, and sing all night, to live forever, Ebert said. 
It's not a stretch to imagine that Ebert might have heard of the buzz surrounding a new songwriter performing a mile from his old town stomping grounds, but Ebert attributed the encounter to, quote, sheer blind luck. Music wasn't his beat, but after witnessing Prine's performance, Ebert was moved enough to share the news of a remarkable local talent. Great minds recognized their peers with a particular acuity. That Friday, October 9th, the Sun-Times ran Prine's first review, written by the young film critic. Quote, he appears on stage with such modesty he almost seems to be backing into the spotlight, Ebert wrote. He sings rather quietly and his guitar work is good, but he doesn't show off. He starts slow. But after a song or two, even the drunks in the room begin to listen to his lyrics. And then he has you. Ebert's article blew the door wide open and Prime went from being celebrated by scenesters to being the talk of suburbanites. Those who'd never set foot in a folk music club soon angled for a spot at the feet of the singing mailman. Quote, after Roger's piece, things changed, Prime said. He wrote that in place of his weekly movie review and everybody would turn to the last page to see what the movie was. He was recognized by this time as a Chicago writer and I was a Chicago kid. And the combination there got the people of Chicago interested to come see this kid. The following night after Ebert's review was Prime's 24th birthday. He had a gig at the fifth peg, so Anne Carroll loaded an oversized sheet cake into the trunk of their Chevelle and surprised him with it at the club. Prime became so popular that a fan even made him a large quilted banner that listed favorite songs Donald and Lydia, Blue Umbrella, Hello in There, Old People, and Unwitting Redundancy, Quiet Man, and Sam Stone, with Prime's name spelled incorrectly in the middle, John P-R-Y-N-E. Quote, we hung it at our apartment for years, Anne Carroll recalled. Overnight, Prime was no longer a neophyte, no longer a mere postal car carrier. Like Ebert and Turkle and Sandberg, Nelson Algren and Gwendolyn Brooks, he'd become an emblem, a living embodiment of Chicago's low-key brilliance, a friend relaying his most pressing thoughts with unfussy poetic clarity. Like these writers, he was a clarion voice of the everyman, a populist poet, a son, of the, a son of the second city born of its confines and built by its people. The Chicago issues a particular test of endurance. It will bury you in parking tickets, then bury you in snow and then drink you under the table. It also pledges its allegiance, its brotherhood to its true blue hearts. Prine's Midwestern parlance was unpretentious, astute and heartrending, and with it, he'd won over the city. Prine took a gamble on Chicago's promise. Soon after Ebert's review, he quit his job with the USPS. Quote, I made 218 an hour at the post office and they didn't pay overtime and they worked just 12 hours a day, Prime said. When I left, the postmaster told me not to take my retirement because I'd be back. I told him, you don't get it. Even if this singing thing doesn't work out, I ain't never coming back. Most people would have kept both jobs and doubled their money, but I just quit and slept all week. <laughs> as much as Prime insisted that music was a hobby in those days, that he never expected to make it a career, this cavalier move suggests otherwise. As reluctant or uncertain as he might have felt, or thought he felt, or told people he felt, no card-carrying Midwesterner leaves a steady job with a pension without confidence in what comes next. In the wake of Ebert's Inc., Chicago had a new poet laureate. His name was John Prime. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks so much, Aaron. I, I'm so glad you read that chapter. I'm one of the lucky ones who've had an opportunity to read a little bit of this um, more than the rest of you. Um, when is your book coming out, by the way, so we can plug that? November 18th, next week. So exciting. Excellent. I know that uh, we've got a special offer from Bloomsbury that we'll throw in the chat for everyone as well. But yeah, I just absolutely love that. Uh, what is it? Low Key Chicago? What did you, what was it? Low Key Chicago Brilliance. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> All right, so we've had a lot of questions in the chat. So let me just read through them here. Um, this first one's from Simon. And he says, hi, Aaron. In researching for this book, how did your relationship with your dad, your shared love of the album and Western Kentucky factor in? Did you visit Western Kentucky? I, I wanted to, um, but because of the pandemic, I wasn't flying. This was like early stages and we were all afraid of everything. Um, but I've been there plenty of times, you know, <laughs> growing up. And Simon and I know each other from high school, so he, he knows this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think all of that um, comes in. I think there's a lot of emotion in this book, even though it's a reported kind of journalistic work. And I, I hope that you can feel that emotional connection when you're reading the words, um, because certainly like my shared provenance um, and kind of my emotional understanding um, of, of those 
um, regions, um, I hope shines through. And so, so yeah, it was definitely um, first and foremost in my mind when I was writing this. Yeah, it's interesting too, because there's two Midwesterners that really come up a lot, which is, uh, you know, who are uh, Bob Dylan and John Prine in this book and two totally different trajectories, maybe in terms of like, you know, humbleness, um, <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because, you know, uh, being from the Midwest, I think we have like these, these top five or six songwriters from the Midwest that like everyone celebrates. And when I when I think of these folks, for me, it's Bob Dylan, it's Prince, it's Bob Seger, it's John Mellencamp, and it's John Prime, right? Like those are kind of like the big Midwestern five. Like some people may say Paul Westerberg, but I would say that he's kind of later, um, more contemporary, but anyway. Um, and, and yeah, Prine, I think, was so low-key and so modest in this really authentic way. Like, there wasn't a lot of, um, like, fanciness or celebrity around Prine, like there was around Bob Dylan, right? He wasn't, like, trying to create a persona or, like, pull one over on the listener, right? Like, he, he wasn't trying to trick us or, like, um, you know, the thing about Prine is that he wanted everyone to be invited in. Um, and, and his words are so moving. Um, and so plain spoken and, and, and plain in this poetic way. And I think that's intentional um, because I don't think he ever wanted to alienate everyone. And I think that's a very Midwestern quality, right? Like we talk about Midwestern nice. Um, and I think Prime was that in a very genuine way. Um, and, and also um, he just was who he was. Like he never tried to be anything that he wasn't. Um, and I think that's why like folks in Nashville felt like they knew him, right? Cause he was the guy shooting pool down the street. Um, like it's just it's just who he was, um, and I and I love that about him, and I love that about this album. Yeah, um, just as an aside, I sort of came into Prine like through other people covering his songs. So the original, you know, Sam Stone that I heard was Swamp Dog, which is a completely different version, kind of like you know, yeah, a little bit more soulish. And then eventually that took me into finding this record. And then just all of the other, I mean, it's like way too many people to name. I mean, even spiritualized, I think, uses that line um, in one of their songs. Uh, yeah. Pop Shoot Cop. So yeah, uh, it's interesting how many people he's influenced. Mm -hmm. um, a couple comments too. Um, Ed Holstein still ambles the streets and teaches and plays John songs. He has many stories to tell. Yeah. Um, let me see here. So this comes from Jack. Um, have you had a chance to talk about or with John, or I'm sorry, have you had a chance to talk about John with Fiona? And I do not know who Fiona is, I'm sorry. Fiona's his wife, and no, not yet. Um, so when I was when I was working on this book, um, Old Boy Records knew that I was working on it, I told them, but it, again, I'm a journalist, it's a journalistic work, so I wanted to maintain sort of this journalistic independence, right? So um, I very much approached it in that way in sort of like this objective way, even though I feel like there's a lot of emotion that comes through. Um, so I didn't really involve um, Fiona or the label too closely, um, although they knew I was working on it. Um, but now that it's out, um, they've they've read a galley, all the folks there, um, Jody and, and Fiona, and they, they love the book and um, they support it. And I, I think I'm gonna be doing um, at least one event with us with Oh Boy down in Nashville, um, which is very exciting. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I was so honored whenever um, they wrote to me and said that they they really loved the book and they think that John would have loved it too. Um, so that was really special. That's great. Um, this comes from M. It says, it sounds like songs written prior to, sounds like the songs were written prior to the LP's release. Um, they did not make the cut. Um, how were the songs selected for the eponymous LP? And what songs besides souvenirs show up later? Yeah, um, so I think it was a matter of time, right? Like I think um, the, the first thing to know is that this was the first folk record on Atlantic, Re on Atlantic Records. It was kind of an experiment. Um, they were an R&B label, they were a soul label. And so this was new territory for them and they weren't quite sure where to put Prime, um, but they paired him um, with American Sound Studios in Memphis um, with the Memphis Boys, who's the house band there, and then the producer, Arif um, Martin, he was like a very um, prestigious producer in the realm um, of sort of R&B and, and soul and that, and pop. Um, so I think, you know, they weren't sure what was going to happen <laughs> when they were down there working on this. And so I think when they got through, um, you know, a, a number of songs, like, uh, that was kind of it. They were like, okay, we're done. 
you know, like, because this is, this is costing them, um, you know, by the hour and there's all these kind of heavy hitters down there. And so I think when the label thought they were done, they were done. And I, I Prine has said that he would have recorded more songs um, had they allowed it, but I think they kind of were like, okay, that's it. We got it. Um, so yeah, uh, there are a number of songs that Prine, um, was performing um, or had written that show up later. Um, Blue Umbrella, Sour Grapes. Um, I'm trying to think of some others off the top of my head. Um, the Frying Pan is another one. I mean, he'd written that for Ann Carroll. Um, so there, there are quite a few that show up on the second and third albums that were kind of around since Prime was um, either in his late teens or early 20s. Because um, because again, he was uh, he was a club performer. Right. And so he was always very conscious just of the fact that like he wanted enough material to kind of keep the audience engaged. Um, so, so yeah, he'd certainly been working um, these songs and the Chicago clubs like well before they were recorded. Yeah, that's a really interesting chapter when he goes down to record because just this like kind of disconnect between a folk musician who's kind of used to carrying things with his voice and the lyrics. And then you've got, um, you know, just these fantastic players that are trying to you know, there's just a difference there, but they, they do find something that works so well on that record. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is definitely a Chicago question. Um, this comes from John. Have you found a place that pours a good Malort on the West Coast? <laughs> no. Good and Malort should not be in the same sentence together also. <laughs> but... No, no, there's no old style here. There's no Malort here. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a completely different vibe. Although I will say, um, one thing that's um, really comforting, comforting to me here is um, Lance, who ran Permanent Records in Chicago for a long time. Um, he's here now, and he opened up what he calls a roadhouse. Um, it's called the Permanent Records Roadhouse, and when you walk in, it looks like a Chicago bar. Um, it's dark wood. It's kind of like cracked vinyl booths, and um, actually, maybe he has my lord. I don't know, um, but it, yeah, that's the closest to home that I've found here, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let me scroll through. What are your favorite? So this comes from Linda. Um, what are your favorite albums after his first, his self-titled? Oh gosh, um, I love Bruised Orange a lot. Um, a you know has like Fish and Whistle and like um, songs that I love. But I, I love that it's such a cl collaboration between John and Steve Goodman too, because Goodman produced that one. Um, and I just think um, in terms of like the production and the clarity of the album. I, I love it. I love that one so much. Um, I love, I love Sweet Revenge. Um, I love Storm Wind. I mean, I love all of them. Um, a Tree Forgiveness even like, uh, it's amazing that he, <laughs> that's his last record, right? He wrote that in his latter days and the songs are as good as the songs on the first album. I mean, the guy, um, just didn't miss really. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I love, so many of the records. This comes from uh, Jennifer. On the topic of modesty, can actually I should say from Jay, not from Jennifer. Mm -hmm. On the topic of modesty, can Aaron speak about John's stage props, items he loved and kept on stage with him? And it says the Lincoln Museum in Springfield currently has an exhibit which includes his stool with Jughead Comics. Oh, I love that. Gosh, I want to go to that exhibit. Um, you know. For this book, I was, um, you know, dealing with the early days, and at this time, Prime wasn't like a totally comfortable performer. Um, so I'm not sure like how many props he was actually using, but I do love that quilted banner that I mentioned in that chapter. And um, there are photos on the of it on the internet. You can Google it. But um, yes, uh, someone who was coming to the fifth peg like that early before he'd even released a record, loved his music and loved him so much that they made this quilt with all of the song titles and his name spelled incorrectly in the middle. So like, <laughs> that's humbling, right? Um, but yeah, P-R-Y-N-E. And um, you can see photos of him with that in the background. Um, Cause he, I think he really appreciated that. That was like his first piece of fan art, right? Um, so I, I love that. And then um, just like his Martin guitar too. I love the evolution of John's guitars in the early days because um, he worked really hard to buy them. Like it's not something where, you know, his parents were just giving him money to buy instruments. Um, he took a job at a church in Maywood on Sundays, like dusting crosses and cleaning pews so that he could buy his second guitar, which was a Gibson Humminbird. 
Um, and then eventually he upgraded to the Martin and he bought that um, at a store in downtown Chicago. I think it's called the Guitar Gallery um, that, that John and Billy like to go to. Um, so yeah, I think it was very, very modest in those early days, but those couple of things I think are really key to kind of who he was. And I also love his uh, Canadian tuxedo that he always wore, right? Um, and kind of like his his rooster hair all fluffed up, like kind of his bad haircut. I just, it's so unassuming. Um, and it's just so like authentic to who he was. This one comes from Peter. Um, this is a great, good question, Peter. Um, can you discuss John's relationship with Steve Goodman? Did they collaborate on writing or ever perform together? Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, John and Steve loved each other. Um, and, and Carol, his first wife actually told me that she believed that John and Steve were closer than John was with some of his blood brothers. Um, that, that's how close they were. Um, and and I, I love it because they're sort of like um, mirror twins in a way. Steve, Steve was really short, <laughs> um, first of all. Um, he was super outgoing, super performative, just like such a performer, right? Such a um, sort of magnetic personality. And John was very shy and introverted and unassuming. Um, and so I think they really complimented one another in that way. And Steve was an amazing guitar player. Like I think Steve might've been a better guitar player than maybe he was a lyricist. And John was the opposite. John was a less skilled guitar player, right? Who sort of relied on cowboy chords, um, but he was a profound lyricist. And so I think um, just sort of like the opposite nature of them really, really drew them together. But yeah, I mean, they were discovered together at this, basically at the same time in New York. Um, they played The Bitter End together in New York when they first released um, each of their first albums. Um, Steve produced Bruised Orange. Bruised Orange. Um, there's television specials on the internet where, um, that you can watch where they perform together. Um, they just, they were each other's ride or die. <laughs> and I, I just, I, I love that. And, and Steve really gave so much of himself to John um, knowing that his days were sort of numbered because he had leukemia, um, which is like, I think so generous and, and special and amazing. Okay, so this question comes from Tracy. Um, two of my favorite artists who cover John Prine are Evan Dando and Kurt Vile. Oh, I love this question. Who would you love to see cover a John Prine song and which song? Oh man. Um, oh my gosh. I, I would love to see, this is this is a pipe dream, um, but I would love to see the Cocktail Twins reform and perform um, Far From Me. Far From Me is my favorite song in the first album because it's such a, um, it's such just the classic country song, right? And there's so much um, sadness um, and I like to get sad, I'd be kind of sad sack. Um, but I love when um, bands, operate or kind of work outside of their genre. And I think Cocteau Twins, um, kind of their shimmering, uh, shoegazy dream pop application to that classic country song would be pretty amazing. And uh, I think the sadness would sort of come through in a really pretty way. Yeah, you really sold that. That sounds amazing. I would not <laughs> put those, those two together, but yeah, no, that, that sounds awesome. <laughs> My favorite covers are covers that transform the song. Um, I don't, I don't love straight ahead renderings um, as a cover. I love a transformation. Totally get that. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is from Linda. Um, how did John progress from shy boy performer to producing Oh Boy records? Um, that's a little bit later, but but um, as far as I know, John became disillusioned with major labels. I think he got um, sort of dragged through the ringer in the major label system. And so I think at a certain point, he wanted to own his masters. He wanted to own his publishing. Um, he, I think he just had the realization that like, why should someone else own my art, right? And I think he had built up a strong enough community in Nashville to where he could do that kind of thing. Um, and it was like one of the best moves that he ever made in his career um, because people are so dedicated to Oh Boy even, even today and now his family runs it, which I think is amazing. But yeah, that's my sense is that he was pretty disillusioned um, with the major label experience. Gotcha. Um, we got one here. Um, is there a story about how Prine ended up on Atlantic 
or how, why they took a chance on him? Yeah, um, so y'all probably know the Christofferson discovery story. Um, it's in the book, but Steve Goodman convinced Chris Christofferson to come to the Earl of Old Town one night and see Prime perform. It was after hours, it was like two o'clock in the morning and Paul Anka, weirdly, who's the Canadian pop singer and Chris Christofferson came to see Prime and they were both floored. And then Paul Anka said, okay, Goodman and Prime, I'm gonna fly you to New York so you can track some demos. We're gonna, we're gonna get you record deals. Um, so they flew out to New York and Paul Anka's dime. And when they got off the plane, um, they picked up a copy of the Village Voice in the airport and they saw that Christofferson was performing at the Bitter End in Grand Village. And they were like, wow, like this, this is an amazing coincidence. So they went um, by the club to go catch Christofferson. Christofferson insisted that each of them play a couple songs to open. Um, so, so yeah, um, what Christofferson didn't tell them, and I don't know if it's because Christofferson didn't know or because he didn't want to freak them out, but it was sort of like a label showcase that night. So Jerry Wexler from Atlantic Records was in the audience um, and he decided to sign Prime. He just said like, the songs are amazing. The lyrics are great. Um, let's, let's try this kid, you know? Um, and that's sort of how it happened. Uh, Jerry Wexler over the years was asked like why he picked Prime over Goodman. Um, and he always kind of obfuscated and said like, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, maybe I thought the songs were stronger, um, but but yeah, that's kind of how it happened. Interesting. Um, question here uh, from Mike. Can you tell us more about the album cover art? And that's kind of a funny story in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is in the book. Um, but so I mentioned that this was the first folk record on Atlantic and they weren't quite sure what to do with him, right? Cause it was sort of an experiment. Um, so after they recorded the album in Memphis they flew John out to do a photo shoot in San Francisco with this photographer. Um, and this guy was a concert photographer like he had worked in the realm of musicians um, and he was kind of like Prime where he was known for capturing subjects in their natural environments, right? He was sort of like a documentarian man that way. Um, but for whatever reason, when Prine showed up, uh, this guy just had it in his head that he wanted to stick Prine on a bale of hay. And um, at the time, Prine was pretty shy. Um, and I don't think, you know, throughout this process, it was pretty overwhelming. And I don't think he asserted himself very strongly. Um, but he's talked about how, like, he'd never seen a bale of hay, hay in his life, you know, even going down to Kentucky. Um, and, uh, you know, Ann Carroll, his first wife was like, yeah, I mean, you know, John's from Maywood. <laughs> like we don't, we don't have hay in Maywood, but I think it's um, sort of what I was talking about where it's like these coastal institutions can sort of misunderstand us, right? And I think it's funny to sort of think about a New York record label, assuming that a guy from Chicago would sit on a bale of hay. Um, and so I think, I think that's sort of where that comes from. Um, but Prime could laugh about it later. He had a very good um, attitude about it, which I thought was very charming. We'll just do maybe one or two more here. Um, so this comes from Ray. Um, John had many collaborations with female singers. What was the uh, what were the earliest renditions? I love his work with Iris Dement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love I love um, that too. Um, well, I mean, I think in the early days, not on recordings, but I you know I've heard that he and Bonnie Kolak. Um, would sing together live. And I don't know if anyone is here who witnessed that. I would love to hear the stories if you did. Um, but that's my understanding because um, Earl Pianchi, who was the proprietor of the old Earl of Old Town, um, before he passed away, they did this reunion show for Earl's 80th birthday. They did it, I think they did it. What's that club in Berwyn? What's that place called? You know what I'm talking about? Fitzgerald's. Fitzgerald's. Yeah, they did it. I think they did it at Fitzgerald's and it was like a private event and all of the um, folks from the 70s folk music scene in Chicago gathered to sort of celebrate Earl Pianchi for his 80th birthday. And Bonnie Kolak was there and Ed Holstein was there and Prine showed up. All these folks were there. And I think um, I've seen a video of it and they sort of talk about how they would sing together and how Bonnie and John um, had sung together. Um, in the 70s. So um, that may have been his first 
um, female collaborator in a live setting. But of course, you know, when we get into like Bruce Orange, there's great backup singers on that album. Um, and yeah, certainly when he got to Nashville, um, the collaborations with Iris DeMent and then later on uh, Amanda Shires and um, Margot Price and Casey Musgraves and all those folks, um, I think they all really admired him and it's kind of cool. It was kind of cool to see that happen. Um, let me just check on one more here. I will ask that question, Simon, um, but I'm gonna ask one of my own. Is there any, are there any artists today that you think might be like kind of mining the same sort of like vibe as John Prine or anyone maybe that has some sort of the integrity? Cause reading this book, he definitely, you know, comes across as an artist that's not interested in the commerciality of music. That was the furthest thing from his head. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a number of songwriters today. Um, you know, when we think about Chicago, I think Jeff Tweedy is very much in that zone, right? Kind of doing his own thing, um, especially now with some of like the solo stuff that he's doing um, and the newer local, local albums. I think that he's definitely in that lineage. Um, when we think of people like Jason Isbell, I think it's the same kind of spirit, right? It's not the same sonically, but I think um, in terms of representing um, place and representing like individual vision outside of like commercial expectation, I think that he's um, sort of carrying the torch for that. But then there's like smaller people. Um, there's this guy in Portland um, who's a singer songwriter who I love, his name's Barna Howard. Um, he releases records on this little label called Mama Bird. And um, I, I think it's his first record that I really love and it's very primey. It's very just guitar and voice, um, really clever lyrics. Um, so people like that too, I think are really carrying the torch for Prime. Um, and that's one reason why I think Pride will always be in the conversation, right? Because anytime we encounter a brilliant new songwriter, they will always cite John Prime. Like, I don't, I don't think that there will ever be a songwriter who's never heard of John Prime or who doesn't love him. And so I think that's how he will sort of like live eternally in the culture. All right. And this will be our last question for the night. Um, it comes from Simon. Hi, Simon. What, what are you, what are you working on next? <laughs> What's next um, for Aaron? It's funny, I did a podcast recently with a friend of mine, Steve Hyden, who's also a music journalist and critic. And um, he pointed out that I've written, now written two books about Midwestern singer songwriters. And I was like, oh man, really backed myself in a corner, haven't I? Um, but <laughs> that said, I, I'm writing, I'm working another book. Um, it's not sold yet or anything. It's very much in the proposal stage, but um, I want to do a critical exploration of Heartland Rock. Um, and so nobody take that idea, please. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's something, it's a genre that I think um, doesn't exist anymore. And so I, I wanna like interrogate um, kind of the roots and the meaning of Heartland Rock and look at its um, titans and kind of what happened to it, like where did it go? Um, so that's my next project. That was amazing. I'm sure it'll be just as great as these other two that you've written. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, Aaron, thank you again so much for joining us. This was a pleasure. I um, hope that everyone in the audience enjoyed this. Um, we are going to be hosting Christopher Weingarten December 16th to talk about public enemies. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. We're going to be continuing up and through May, up, uh, through May of 2020. It sounds weird to say that, to even think about that far, but um, we're going to be doing that. So um, at the conclusion of the program, you should receive a survey. Um, if you could fill that out and let us know how the program went and how everything's going, it always helps us with our programming. Um, the, the show tonight is going to be recorded. So uh, once we have a link and we clean it up, um, we'll send out links to everyone that registered for the program. Um, again, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Congratulations with the new book. Thank you. Yeah. And if anyone in the um, who joined us today has um, cool prime stories from back in the day, please email me and tell me your stories because I love I love to hear old stories about prime. Um, and if you want to find me on the internet, I'm on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. If you just Google my name and Twitter, my handle will come up and I will follow you back. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Leslie, uh, Dan, 
you wrote us an email earlier in the day talking about how much you were looking forward to this program. Thanks so much for, for showing up tonight. Um, it's always good to hear that and get that kind of feedback. So, all right, everyone, have a wonderful night. Thanks, Aaron. Good Thank luck you. with the new book launch. Bye. Take care. Good night.